It's the Adam Ragusea podcast. Time for Ask Adam. Hi, Adam. Uh, my name is Harrison. I'm a 19 year old finishing his freshman year of college. Big fan of you and your work. And I'm also a big fan of versatility, which is why when deciding what cookware I should buy in order to make as many dishes as possible uh, for as little money as I could in this college dorm of mine, I went for this carbon steel skillet. It's like 11 inches and it has served me very well. Um, but as you can see, I've been having trouble seasoning it evenly. And I am asking this question, I suppose, to get your advice on how to better season it or whether I should even be seasoning it at all. I know you're a subscriber to the mindset that my cookware should serve me and not the other way around. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's my question. would really appreciate if you answered it. So Harrison, I want to preface my response to you by saying something that I've said before, which is that there is virtually no publicly available scientific literature pertaining to pan seasoning. Some companies may be sitting on proprietary research, but there are so many variables involved in seasoning pans. The situation really cries out for the scientific method, not just for lived experience or collective inherited wisdom. I don't think that anybody really knows the best way to season pans or why some ways work better than others. Or if they do know it, it's information that they are keeping to themselves in the context of proprietary corporate research. It's not in the scholarly record. I am going to nonetheless give you some background on carbon steel pans, and I will give you my best guess as to uh, how to improve your experience with them. So carbon steel. Carbon steel is another one of those terms that means absolutely nothing if you take it at face value because literally all steel is carbon steel. Steel is iron with a little bit of carbon in it, and maybe some other things, but iron plus a little carbon is the defining alloy, that is steel. Stainless steel, as I understand it, is usually made with just a tiny, tiny fraction of carbon, tiny fraction of a percent of carbon plus some other things, most notably chrome, which is what makes it shiny. So when people say carbon steel, it's shorthand for high carbon steel and or steel that is mostly just iron with a little bit of carbon and maybe some other tiny additions, but it's not at least 11% chromium like stainless steel is. So they call it carbon steel to distinguish it. Carbon steel, according to the uh, American Iron and Steel Institute, is 0.05 to 2.1% carbon. The darker the metal is, the more carbon it has, probably. Situation gets even more confusing when you consider the fact that cast iron is iron with not less but more carbon than high carbon steel. Cast iron is really steel with more than 2% carbon in it. Cast iron has more carbon than carbon steel. Carbon steel has many of the same properties as cast iron. Carbon steel has many of the same properties as cast iron. They're both relatively poor conductors of heat, which in the context of cooking is actually a good thing or it can be a good thing. The pan is able to serve as like a regulator valve on your stove. It keeps your heat from spiking and dipping all the time because it's a poor conductor. So it holds on to heat and that's a good thing when you're cooking, can be a good thing. But um, the difference with carbon steel as compared to cast iron is uh, carbon steel is, is more ductile, is what it's called. And what that means is that you can cut and press carbon steel out of sheets, just like they do with stainless steel, which is why carbon steel pans tend to be shaped more like a stainless steel pan. They tend to be thinner and lighter than cast iron, which is not stamped out of sheets. Rather, it is formed by pouring molten metal into a mold, casting. That's why they call it cast iron. This is also why carbon steel pans tend to be smoother 
on their surface than cast iron pans because they've been pressed out of a sheet. Cast iron pans are formed in a mold that's made out of sand, and the little grains of sand leave dimpled impressions in the surface. Now, there is expensive cast iron cookware on the market where they polish the surface down. Also, lots of antique cast iron is very smooth from polishing, but also I suspect maybe just from use, you know? Some people say that the uh, dimpled surface on cast iron is actually why cast iron is able to hold a seasoning layer so well. The dimples give you more surface area, more little teeny cracks and crevices for the seasoning layer to reach down into and grab a hold of something. And over many years of seasoning and use, you can end up getting a smoother surface because all the dimples fill up with polymerized oil, aka seasoning. I have no idea if any of that is true. <laughs> it's just stuff people say, and it sounds like it could be true. But again, none of these assertions about seasoning have been tested in publicly available scientific literature, so we're all just guessing. However, all of that would explain why carbon steel pans maybe don't seem to hold onto their seasoning layer as strongly as cast iron pans do. Could just be a physical, mechanical thing. It's harder to grab a hold of a smooth surface, right? Could also be a chemical thing. You know, maybe the seasoning forms a weaker bond to a pan that has less carbon in it. Remember that carbon steel has less carbon than cast iron, and seasoning layers have carbon in them. That's part of the seasoning layer, and carbon likes to bond to carbon, so maybe that's a thing. I don't know. I'm just talking out my ass here. <laughs> Again as most people do when they talk about seasoning. As far as I've been able to tell, no research about any of this stuff as it applies to pans. The thought has also occurred to me, though, um, that maybe carbon steel actually does hold on to seasoning just as well as a cast iron pan does. It is simply the case that because the carbon steel is lighter in color, we can see more easily when the seasoning layer has flaked off. As opposed to a cast iron pan, which is black as midnight, right? It's going to look black whether there's a seasoning layer on it or not. Maybe the cast iron is losing its seasoning layer too. We just can't see it as clearly. Again, just spitballing here, which is all anybody does when it comes to cast iron and carbon steel seasoning. Here's one thing, however, I can say for sure. Carbon steel pans are most popular among professional cooks. They only recently penetrated the consumer kitchen market. And professional cooks will very often re-season their pan several times in a night. I've even heard about people doing it before every single use of that pan. There's a guy I was talking at who worked at a very fancy and well-known fish place. He said that he would put the pan on the stove, rub a thin layer of oil on it, burn it off, pour in some more oil, lay in the fish fillet. Lean fish is really sticky and very delicate. And so that freshly laid patina really helped him finish the dish. He'd finish the dish, get the fish out, but without, without tearing it, wipe out the pan, and then repeat the process right? Put in another thin layer of oil, burn it off, cook another fish fillet for probably hundreds of fish fillets in a night. I have heard about uh, wok guys doing something similar. We tend to think that seasoning is this thing that we can only do in the oven with this multi-hour process that people on the internet tell us to do, that I've told people to do on the internet, but you can do it in minutes on the stovetop as well. Totally possible. Lay in a super thin layer of oil, burn it off on the stovetop until you have a visible patina. It'll happen in minutes and cook. You know, you're not going to get a super even seasoning layer, especially not up the sides of the pan, right? And maybe it'll be uh, prone to cracking if you then cool the pan down too rapidly, which could be easy to do out here in normal atmospheric temperatures. That's why they let the pan cool really slowly when they do it in the oven, right? 
makes it less likely that thermal shock is going to cause problems. But, um, you know, yeah, you can totally, totally do a quick reseason on the stovetop. And I have done that myself. I actually did it in a video a couple of years ago, the, uh, the cast iron non recipe, my non that I was doing in the cast iron was sticking real bad. And as I was up against a deadline on the video, so I just did a super quick reseason on the stovetop and then it worked like a charm. The problem with that is it is stinky. That's a very smelly, smoky procedure. And the professional cooks probably don't care that much because they are working underneath professional ventilation hoods. Though God knows what breathing in those fumes are doing to them in the long term. But the hood gets the fumes away before it really stinks up the joint. Or if it does stink up the joint, it stinks up the kitchen and not the dining room. And chefs are used to working in a stinky kitchen. You're not maybe so used to working in a super stinky home kitchen. And you're certainly probably not so used to working in a a super stinky dorm, or at least if the dorm is stinky, it's not because of smoke. You generally can't get dorm rooms very smoky, right? Because especially dorms these days have very sensitive smoke detectors. (laughs) For good reason. All of this is to say that I do think um, that a carbon steel pan was probably a poor choice for that dorm life. Probably a poor choice. Seasoning a pan necessarily involves burning some oil, and that's going to make smoke. Just going to be a thing that you're going to have to deal with, Harrison, and probably not a great thing to be dealing with in the dorm. I will say uh, I am, however, a big fan of seasoning waxes. There's a company that I will shout out. They're called Buzzy Wax. Hashtag not an ad. They make these great seasoning waxes that actually smell kind of good as they burn. But my last thought for you, uh, Harrison, is, uh, you know, be open to the idea that maybe your patina is not quite as uneven as it looks, or at least maybe it's not quite as uneven as it looks compared to a patina on a cast iron pan. It might simply be the case that imperfections in the patina are just more visible on a carbon steel pan because the carbon steel pan is lighter and shinier because it has less carbon than cast iron which you would never be able to figure out based upon these garbage names that we use to describe the objects in our life. Oh, one other thing that I wanted to say. Um, In the absence of any actual data on this subject, I will say that in my experience, the people who have the best experiences with both cast iron and carbon steel tend to be the, the people who cook with it all the time. People use that pan all the time because the simple act of cooking with the pan helps to build up the patina, layer by tiny little layer. I would guess, Harrison, that your pan will build up a nice, more even patina as you use it, as you care for it, as you love it, and as you tell it that you love it, and you re-season it many times. It'll probably just get better and better. That's good. Hi, Adam. Uh, My name's Jared from San Francisco, California. Uh, I was curious where your interest in bodybuilding came from. I grew up in a household of bodybuilders. My dad was an amateur competitor in Massachusetts, uh, although he lacked the lower body genetics to turn pro. Um, But he did train Jay Cutler earlier on in his career um, before he moved out west. Uh, I knew him as a kid as Uncle Jay, as you know, many Sicilian American families make family friends into uncles. Um, but he lived at my house until I was about 10, and then he moved out to California and eventually Vegas and eventually became the four-time champ. Um, but uh, bodybuilding was never something I got into other than just being happy for my uncle. And so I was wondering uh, what your interest in, uh, in it was and if you ever thought about competing. Uh, thanks. Uncle Jay! Uncle Jay, that's four-time Mr. Olympia Jay Cutler, Jared is talking about, living in his house. Jared, my interest in bodybuilding is probably one of the weirdest things about me. I can't really explain it. I suppose I fell into it in the same way that lots of people do, which is that I was just trying to learn how to lift weights 
so that I could be stronger and fitter. And when I was very young, trying to learn how to lift weights involved buying magazines to read. And when I got a little older, YouTube existed. And so I went on YouTube to learn how to lift. And whom do you find in the magazines? Whom do you find on YouTube when you go to learn how to lift? You're going to find bodybuilders. Other kinds of people lift, of course, but bodybuilders are the most conspicuous. And so first you start watching these guys because they're teaching you how to lift, even though much of what they're teaching you is probably wrong (laughs) because these are genetically superior human specimens who are also on lots of drugs and eating six to eight meals a day. So pretty much anything they do in the gym is going to make them grow. So they might not be giving you the best advice, but anyway, you watch these bodybuilders so that you can learn how to lift. But eventually you just become invested in them as people. These are often very colorful personalities, except for the ones who are uh, not colorful personalities, the ones who are dull as wooden boards. Jay used to be pretty dull, or at least he came off that way in interviews and such. In the early days of YouTube, which was like 2006, 2007, that was the beginning of Jay's Olympia reign. And so he was all over YouTube. Jay Cutler is who I found when I first went to the YouTubes to try to learn how to lift. And at that time, he had shockingly little personality. (laughs) He, He has grown a personality belatedly. He talks about that now. He talks about how he was a robot back in his competing days because everything about his lifestyle had to be so regimented to eat and train perfectly and become the champ. Uh, So 2006, 2007, early days of YouTube and early days of me watching bodybuilders on YouTube. Kai Green was also there. Kai Green hitting the scene right around that same time. And Kai had personality. I got invested in the personalities. And then I started watching the competitions. And it's like, If somebody in the house with you is watching a movie that you don't really care about, but you overhear enough of that movie that you get kind of invested in it without trying to, and you end up really wanting to find out how it ends, even though it's not a movie that you would normally watch or care about. That's sort of what happened to me with bodybuilding, competitive bodybuilding. (laughs) There's There's a YouTube channel called Bro Science Life that a lot of people know about because it's very successful. It's basically, it's a parody bodybuilding channel. The guy's been around for years and he did a very funny riff in a recent video where he talked about you, the viewer, the viewer of a bodybuilding channel. He talked about how you, you started off just wanting to get fit so you get girls or boys uh, or other kinds of people as the case may be. You started off just trying to get fit to uh, get people to want to have sex with you. (laughs) And now you've just got a browser full of tabs with these oiled shirtless men because trying to learn about fitness sent you down this path of following a sport, sport in quotation marks, that involves oiled shirtless men posing. And that's just kind of how it happens. You get sucked down the rabbit hole. I got sucked down the rabbit hole. And bodybuilding is a fascinating subculture. It is a troubling subculture in innumerable ways. People listening who do not follow bodybuilding might not have heard that there has been a rash of high-profile bodybuilder deaths in recent months. Now, the sample size is so small that it's impossible to tell if this is some kind of meaningful trend or just a coincidence, but certainly hardcore bodybuilding is not a healthy activity, and nobody who does it seriously claims that it is a healthy activity. And the drugs are not the only risky thing about it. The eating is risky. The crash dieting and dehydration for competition, that's risky. The hardcore training is risky, especially if you keep pushing it later and later in life as guys are doing these days. Lee Haney, who was Mr. Olympia all the way uh, through the 80s, Haney retired when he was 32. Most top-level competitive bodybuilders are just getting started at age 32 these days. And when they die prematurely... They are often found to have massive hearts, cardiomegaly. Certainly the drugs are probably a factor there. 
But serious athletes in general tend to develop enlarged hearts. It's called athletic heart syndrome. And part of that may just be from the incredible physical stress of heavy training year after year after year. Side note to a side note, the Foo Fighters drummer, Taylor Hawkins, who died, um, he was found to have a very enlarged heart when he died, like double the normal size for a man his age. And he was 50 something when he died, right? And everybody is talking about Taylor Hawkins's drug use and how that may have contributed to his enlarged heart. And it you know, probably did if he was taking stimulants, right? But nobody is talking about his drumming. Playing drums for a heavy rock act is a very serious cardio exercise session. You play 200 shows a year, two hours a show, and you do that for 30 years, as Taylor Hawkins did. I wonder if that alone enlarges your heart. Vinnie Paul died with an enlarged heart, too. Drummer for Pantera. I wonder if drummer's heart might be a real thing. Maybe that's a a research project for somebody out there. Hey, it's Adam from the uh, slightly more recent past. I recorded this episode, episode 10 of the Adam Ragusea pod. I recorded this before Rolling Stone published an article that raised the very possibility of professional drumming being rough on the old ticker. So that's why I didn't discuss it. Okay, back to me in the slightly more distant past talking about bodybuilding. Anyway. I suppose that tangent there demonstrates that I am also generally interested in exercise science and nutrition science, of course, and those topics intersect with bodybuilding. So put that all together, I follow competitive bodybuilding. I've come to appreciate it as an art, which is what it is. It's not a sport. Just because something is athletic doesn't make it a sport. Dance is athletic too, and they hold dance competitions, but dance is not a sport. Bodybuilding is not a sport. It is a performance slash body modification art. And I don't think being honest about that diminishes bodybuilding. And no, Jared, I I have never once thought about competing in bodybuilding. I have no genetic talent in the upper or lower body. There was a, a period in my late 20s When I worked for Boston University and I had no kids and therefore no real responsibilities, tons of time, and I had access to the BU gym, which was a great gym, and I trained and I ate like a bodybuilder religiously for about three years. And I looked good for like a person, but I looked completely unremarkable as like a bodybuilder. I didn't even look like a bodybuilder. Maybe if I took drugs, I could have looked a little remarkable, but... The thing is that all the really good bodybuilders, they seem to be working from a basis of natural genetic talent, right? They all looked pretty amazing before they even got onto gear. Gear, for those who are uninitiated, gear is what they call performance-enhancing drugs in the bodybuilding world. It's a more inclusive term than steroids, which is useful. It's useful to have a more inclusive term because bodybuilders take a lot of drugs in addition to anabolic steroids. They take other classes of hormones like insulin and growth hormone. Anyway, that's why they call it gear. Anyway, if any young people are listening to me right now, which I know you are, and if any of you are getting intrigued about bodybuilding drugs, please let me reiterate that everyone in that world who knows what they're talking about, they all agree that you should train and eat very seriously and bodybuild naturally for many, many years before you even think about taking drugs. You got to learn the basics first. You got to find out if you have any genetic potential at all before you even bother with the health and legal risks of PEDs, right? If you're watching YouTube, I think that uh, Dr. Mike Isratel is a really great person to watch for more info on all of this. Dr. Mike Isratel, Renaissance Periodization is the name of the channel. Dr. Mike does very sane, pretty responsible, evidence-based content about all this stuff. Recommend. Plus, if you're a teenage boy, you're basically on steroids anyway. Naturally, your body is throbbing with testosterone and growth hormone. But you, of course, already know that. That's why you can't sleep or think. (laughs) Don't worry. The fever abates with time. 
Oh, hey, real quick. While I cannot explain the appeal of bodybuilding, I can easily explain the appeal of Honey, the sponsor of this episode. Honey is the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or your computer. I am a person who values his time a little bit more than he values his money. And I felt that way even before I started making anything remotely like real money. So I was never a coupon clipper. I was never somebody who would like drive around town comparing prices. I would just figure, look, if I can afford it, I'll afford it. And if I can't, I'll make do without it. This is why Honey is so great for me. Honey saves me money while I'm shopping without costing me any time or effort or brain space You just shop online like you normally do. When you go to check out, the Honey button pops up, and all you do is click Apply Coupons. Honey searches for any coupons that it can find for the site, and if it finds one, you watch the price drop instantly, which is very satisfying. We order a lot of food delivery at the house because I am crazy busy and I cannot cook for my family as often as I would like, and Honey will regularly save me like five or ten bucks on a delivery makes me feel better about tipping the driver super generously. Uh, But I've saved considerably more money on like camera gear purchases, that kind of thing. And again, it costs me zero time. I just shop online. And when I go to checkout, Honey swoops in and saves me money. And Honey doesn't just work on the desktop computer. It works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this, the still-fledgling Adam Ragusea podcast. I don't recommend things I don't use. I use Honey. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash show. That's joinhoney.com slash show. All one word, show. Joinhoney.com slash show. That link is in the show notes. Thank you, Honey. Hey, let's do failure of the week. I failed when I ordered Papa John's pizza and I expected it to be good. It was not. This is how far I have fallen from the days when I ate and trained like a bodybuilder, by the way. Uh, Papa John's, for those who don't know, is a, is a, it's a U.S.-based pizza chain with stores all over the world at this point. The Papa John's crust is super soft and bready. It's almost like a dinner roll. And the sauce is insanely sweet. Devotees know that Papa John's pizza is my guilty pleasure and has been for as long as I can remember. I suppose I should interrogate the nature of food guilty pleasures at some point, right? Why should I feel guilty about eating a food that brings me pleasure? Why should you feel guilty about that? Yes, the founding CEO of Papa John's is apparently kind of a jerk, but he doesn't work there anymore. Plus, if you boycotted every company with a jerk on the board, you'd never be able to buy anything. I guess maybe the pleasure is guilty because I feel that Papa John's pizza is good food, but it's bad pizza. Like if an alien landed in my yard and asked for a representative specimen of pizza, Papa John's is not what I would provide. But I still think it's good food. And we've gotten into this tradition in the house where we order Papa John's on Friday night to kind of, you know, congratulate the kids on a a week of school well done and congratulate us adults probably too. And I have been surprised by how consistent the quality of Papa John's has been since we started this little tradition a few months ago. But tonight, the Papa let us down. Tonight, they massively screwed up the bake on this pizza that they delivered to us. The cheese was barely even melted. It was real gross. And people at independent pizza places, they make mistakes too. But people who work at good independent pizza places usually have too much pride in what they do and where they work to actually send a catastrophic failure of a pizza out to the customer. If you're working at a giant chain and all you're really doing is generating value for shareholders, you botch the pizza and you say, fuck it, put it in the box, send it out. And I failed because I paid for that pizza. And I'm not going to try to get my money back. Because I don't want to be that guy. Hey, Adam. I used to love the videos you uploaded to TikTok. But I noticed you stopped uploading a while ago. Were there any particular reasons you stopped? Maybe it just wasn't right for you. As a man in his late 20s, it feels as though my peers are acutely aware of TikTok's privacy and misinformation concerns. 
but remain mostly uncritical of the same issues with Meta, Instagram, Twitter, etc. Do you think TikTok is uniquely pernicious as a social media site? Is this perception unfair as TikTok is one of the sole non-Western social media platforms? Love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Okay, so the main reason that I stopped uploading to TikTok is because they stopped paying me to upload to TikTok. TikTok paid me to do, I think it was uh, five videos a week, and we did that for a few months. And it was not a secret that they paid me. Uh, I tagged all of the posts with hashtag TikTok partner, and some other disclosure language was in there. Uh, Not a secret. Basically, TikTok was, they were sensitive to the criticism that their platform hosted nothing but hot garbage. So they created a fund to pay a bunch of educational content creators, such as myself, to make things for TikTok that are not hot garbage. That struck me as a noble goal. I thought that I might be able to reach a younger and more diverse audience on TikTok. And I make content professionally. So if somebody wants to pay me to make content... That's a thing that I'm going to consider. I considered it and I accepted it. I believe I did one two-month contract with TikTok and they then renewed to do another one and they did not renew for a third, which is perfectly fine. I was not mad, not mad now, but basically that's it. That's why it, it was a job that ended, you know? I obviously could have continued making TikToks, even if I was not going to get paid directly by TikTok to make them. I chose not to for a couple of reasons that I'll talk about right now. One, it's really very hard to monetize short form content with advertising. You got to give people a piece of content that's long enough and substantial enough that it'll be worth it to them to sit through an ad in the middle of it. Now, obviously, people have found ways of monetizing short-form content. They've found ways of monetizing their TikToks, but none of the available options for monetizing my TikToks made much sense to me at the time from a business perspective, or they were things that I didn't feel ethically good about doing. It is also the case that I found short-form content to be very frustrating from an editorial standpoint. I did some videos where 59 seconds really was enough time to introduce the topic, explain it, and to stick the landing. But in general, I felt like most videos I did were just kind of bad because I couldn't go into the necessary detail or provide the necessary context in the 59 seconds that was available to me. And I found that my videos needed more context on TikTok, not less, because my audience there was younger and less Western. I was talking to people across a pretty wide cultural gap, and I really needed to fill that gap with context, and I couldn't because I only had 59 seconds. (laughs) So the worst example of this is when I did a series of TikToks about pork taboo, pork avoidance, religious and cultural aversions to eating pigs. This is a very culturally touchy subject, obviously, and I thought I was approaching it delicately. I wasn't trying to explain why anyone's religion is wrong. I was just exploring the ample anthropological literature on this topic. Just trying to look at all the theories, the scientific theories about what social and environmental and economic conditions might have contributed to the adoption of pork taboo in certain societies and in certain religious traditions. I ended up doing a whole pretty long YouTube video on this subject that you could go and watch if you haven't seen it already. I did similar stuff on TikTok, but in tiny little bits because I could only post 59 seconds at a time. So I was doing a series. I was posting these short videos in that series and kids kept leaving all of these silly comments. The most common of which was, hey, we Muslims, we don't eat pigs because pigs eat their own poop. They're disgusting creatures. That's why we don't eat them. I was getting that comment over and over and over again from self-identified Muslims. And I thought that I should respond to that comment in some way. 
Um, because the notion that pigs are dirtier than other animals is one of these things that's kind of true, but also kind of not true. It really depends on the environment in which we humans keep our pigs. Wallowing in mud, for example, is an adaptation that pigs will use to stay cool. They're really not evolved for hot sun. They're evolved for shady environments. And that's one theory as to why pork prohibitions emerged in the Middle East when they did. There's evidence that those taboos emerged at a time when humans were deforesting the region of the Middle East and causing desertification. And pigs in that environment would have suddenly found themselves uncomfortably hot. And they would have wallowed in mud and filth in response to try to stay cool, and this behavior might have repelled humans, understandably. Anyway, these commenters, they were saying, hey, we don't eat pigs because pigs eat poop. That's disgusting. That's why we don't eat them. And it made me think about rabbits and hares who really do eat their own poop. It is an integral part of their digestive process. This is how rabbits are able to digest cellulose, grass, right? They are able to take two passes at it if they eat their poop. They run it through their system twice. And in some, but not all, Islamic traditions, in some, rabbit meat is considered okay, nonetheless. And I thought that I could make a fun video about interesting rabbit biology that could also plug into this series that I was doing about pork and I could also respond to this comment that all these kids were leaving in my pork videos, right? I tried that, and this did not go well, as you can imagine, as I should have been able to imagine. You could argue that it was a fatal concept to begin with, and it would have been poorly received even if I had 10 minutes to give it all the context that it required. You'd probably be right to argue that. But it also went particularly poorly because I only had 59 seconds. And it went poorly because that one video went viral, not the whole series of videos of which that video was a part, right? The video got taken out of that context. Not maliciously, that just isn't how TikTok works. There's no way for a viral video to bring its whole series with it. People only see the one video. And a lot of viewers were offended by what I said, and a lot of viewers were offended by things I did not say, but they believed I said nonetheless because I was talking to them across a massive cultural and language divide. Lots of people believed I said things that I literally did not say. And lots of other TikTok creators did response videos where they excerpted 10 seconds from my video and the 10 seconds that they took out made it look like I was the person who was claiming that Muslims don't eat pigs because pigs eat poop. When in fact, I was not the one making that claim. I was simply repeating that claim for the purposes of refuting it. I was doing the opposite of making that claim. It all went real bad. And I think that I did not serve the global discourse on this and related topics very well at all. If you go looking, you will see lots of websites within Islam and other religious communities offering justifications for the pork prohibition. And those justifications are often pseudoscientific in nature. Pseudoscience is a problem everywhere, not just in religion and not just in any particular religion, but it's a problem in this particular case, and that problem should be addressed with content that educates people without confusing them and without making them feel insulted or belittled. And I think I failed in every way with that video. I muddied the waters on this topic. I did not clarify them. And lots of other videos I made for TikTok ran into similar trouble. The rabbit video is just the most dramatic example. So that's why I decided to take a break from short form content when my TikTok contract ran out. Maybe I'll take another stab at it at some point. And in terms of the, uh, the Western suspicion of TikTok, no, that is not why I stopped making TikToks. I have concerns about the ways in which all kinds of apps may be used by all kinds of state and non-state actors to gather information on people for nefarious purposes. 
I will say I am less concerned about this problem than lots of other people are. I think a lot of people, their concern about internet security and stuff crosses the line into hysteria. I don't really care if companies track what I do on the internet because they're doing that so they can serve me targeted ads. And I've actually found a lot of useful products via targeted ads. Like I don't mind it so much anymore. Much of my favorite and most useful camera gear is stuff I found via targeted ads because Google and other companies were tracking me. Granted, with TikTok, we're not just talking about companies who want to sell stuff. We're potentially talking about involvement with the Chinese government. And I do have a lot of problems with the Chinese government. I have a lot of problems with the U.S. government, too. And if you think the Chinese government is the only government that's using social media for mass surveillance, (laughs) you'd be wrong. In general, though, uh, I believe that the causes of freedom and progress are best served by openness and engagement, not by isolation. There are a billion kids on TikTok, and they're going to be there whether I talk to them there or not. So I figured I'll try talking to them there as part of my job. My job is making content for money. And someone offered me the opportunity to do that on TikTok. I did it for a while and the job ended. And I didn't have a good enough experience that I wanted to keep doing it outside of the context of a good paying contract. So that is why I stopped making TikToks. Hello, Adam. I am recording this question on an iPhone, but to you, it may sound like a potato. Uh, but the reason I mention is the app that is recording me has little bars that indicate it's like a, it's like a visualization of the sound, right? And my question is, are those bars, are they volume or are they actually fully representative of the sound? So to put it another way, if you look at Logic or even on like Etsy, you can get engravings with like words that people have said, like they get their wedding vows or something engraved. Are, is that fully encoded sound? And if you took the screenshot of that sound, could you like reverse engineer it to get the sound back, I guess is my question. I don't really understand these visualizations of sound. And I was hoping you could add some clarity. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Ball. Sound is nothing other than volume. Sound is just volumes in sequence a volume of air being pushed or pulled by a vibrating body. The other dimensions of sound that we think about, like frequency, high frequency, low frequency, these are simply volumes in time. I push and pull a volume of air at you in rapid succession, and I make a high frequency. If I push and pull a volume of air at you in not so rapid succession, I make a low frequency. If I push and pull a smaller volume of air, I make a quieter sound. If I push and pull a larger volume of air, I make a louder sound. It's all just different levels of volume in sequence. That is sound. That is music. That is pod. That is everything. So anyway, an audio waveform graphic that you describe, that's a wavy line on a graph, right? It's a wavy line representing positive or negative air pressures, aka volume, And volume is represented by that line's position along the vertical axis of the graph. And that wavy line then proceeds down a horizontal axis, left and right, and that axis represents time. And remember, that's all sound is. Sequences of pushes and pulls in time. So yes, you absolutely could scan a waveform graphic into a computer and have the computer play it back to you as a sound. This is technology that exists and is used. Google waveform tattoos. These are real. People get tattoos of audio waveforms, and they use an app on their phone to scan the waveforms and play back the sound. The waveform is simply an instruction for how fast and how far the speaker cone should move back and forth to push and pull the air. You can easily represent that information with a line on a graph. A vinyl record is the exact same thing. Google image search the grooves of a record under a microscope. You will see that they look just like a waveform because they are. That's what they are. 
Now for this whole uh, phone scanning thing to work, you would have to be able to see the waveform in sufficient detail, aka sufficient resolution, right? Uh, zoom in on that waveform in an audio editor like Logic, and eventually you'll get to a resolution where you can really see the line on the graph very clearly. You would also need to know the scale of the graph. So you would need to know a millimeter along the horizontal axis. That represents how much time exactly, right? You need to know that time scale. If the computer interprets that scale incorrectly, you might get the right sound, but at the wrong frequency, right? Uh, and then the vertical axis, which is the one that re represents the degree of volume, like how loud the sound is at any given moment, right? Um, you would need to know if the graph is using a linear scale or a nonlinear scale, like a logarithmic scale. If you are graphically representing sound, you might want to use a nonlinear scale to compress the graph down into a more manageable physical space to look at. Um, if you use a linear scale where like, you know, one millimeter equals 10 hertz or whatever, always and forever, the, uh, the quiet sounds might be too small for you to actually see on a graph that's only, a, you know, a couple of centimeters tall. So you use some kind of nonlinear scale that basically grades all the volumes on a curve, right? It makes the quiet sounds look louder than they really are so that you can see them more easily on the graph. Software might also apply some smoothing to the waveform. Basically, it might just eliminate some detail of the graph in order to make that waveform prettier to look at, less jagged, uh, or to make the waveform easier for the computer to render. You might be seeing a simplified version of the sound for the purposes of making it easier on the computer. And if you were to scan that simplified version of the sound and play it back, it might sound like a recording passed through an 8-bit video game, right? Because that's why those games sound the way they do. Those sounds are simplified so that less powerful computer chips from the 80s can read and reproduce them. It's low-resolution sound. And then uh, a level meter, like you mentioned, is a different thing. You mentioned seeing a meter bob up and down in real time in response to your voice as you record. And that is a purely one-dimensional display, right? It just shows volume. It does not show volume in time. Or rather, it's showing you a succession of individual volume measurements in real time instead of showing you all of those volume measurements all at once at the same time, which is what the waveform does, because the waveform has two dimensions, right? It has the dimension of volume and it has the dimension of time. This would be like having a book that flashes one word at a time at you <laughs> instead of showing you all of the words at once on the page like a normal book does, right? Furthermore, level meters usually show you a somewhat distorted version of reality in order to make the meter easier for a human being to read. Uh, for example, if you make a loud sound, the meter might show that loud sound and keep showing it for a couple of milliseconds after that loud sound has already stopped, just to make sure that you saw it. If the meter dipped back down as fast as the real world volume of the sound dipped back down, then your eye might not even process that a loud sound just happened by looking at the meter. It's like if I were to write a sentence with some swear words in it, and then if you passed that sentence through a filter that eliminated all of the non-swear words and extended all of the swear words in the place of the eliminated words, just to make sure that you really see those swear words, just to make sure they don't get lost in the shuffle, right? So imagine uh, that the original sentence is, fuck, I wish more goddamn people would subscribe to this bullshit podcast on an actual goddamn podcast app instead of just watching it on goddamn YouTube, thus forcing me to put fucking work into making it look good when it really should just be a goddamn podcast with no fucking visual element at all. Fuck. That's the sentence. So... <laughs> So in our analogy, the level meter is passing that sentence through a filter that extends the most extreme moments 
the swear words in this analogy. And we did that, it would sound something like this. Fuck, bullshit, goddamn, goddamn, fucking, goddamn, fucking, fuck. That's what the level meter would probably actually be showing you. <laughs> but a, uh, a high-resolution waveform graph, right, that is the sound. And you can reproduce the sound from that two-dimensional graph as long as you know how the graph is scaled. By the way, if you're wondering, there's a reason that uh, I am fine with swearing on this podcast, but I generally try to keep the language in my YouTube videos clean. Um, I keep the language clean in any piece of content that I imagine a teacher might want to use in the context of secondary education. I know school teachers who use my food science and my food history videos in class sometimes. And if there's anything I can do to make life easier for school teachers, I'm going to do it. Okay. That's why I bleep those videos, but I'm not going to bleep this podcast because it would be crazy for anyone to use this garbage podcast <laughs> in an educational context. But I'm glad that you listen to this garbage podcast in an entertainment context it's fine if you want to watch it on YouTube instead of listening to it on a podcast app. You do you. It's all good. But you can subscribe to the Adam Ragusea podcast on uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anywhere that you find pod. And you can send a question for me to answer. Ask Adam questions at Gmail. I will be far more likely to answer it if you send me a question in video form or if you're not comfortable with that uh, in audio form. Do me a favor and also uh, type up the question in the email body or the subject line. It'll help me find it. Thank you for finding me. I hope that we find each other here again a week hence. Talk to you next time.